This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. everyone. Um, it's great to see such a large number of people staying for this workshop uh, looking at um, common ground between environmental justice advocacy and labor. Uh, my name is Rachel Morello Frosch and um, I teach here at UC Berkeley in the School of Public Health and the College of Natural Resources. Um, and it's going to be my pleasure today to moderate uh, this panel of distinguished speakers who are going to be uh, talking about some important issues in their work related to environmental justice and labor. I want to just frame some of the issues. Um, each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes. Um, I, I'd like people to hold their questions um, so that we can have plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion. So we're going to try and power straight through uh, in order to leave sufficient time for um, engagement and dialogue. So, in order to frame the question, I just want to state the following issues for you to keep in mind as each speaker goes through their presentation. As today's morning workshops indicated, climate change poses both a threat and an opportunity to improve the futures of low-income communities of color and working class people. And for the first time in over a decade, our country is finally having a serious conversation about how to address climate change and California appears to be leading the way with the passage and implementation of the Global Warming Solution Act. Yet with these opportunities to retool our economy and move toward a more sustainable future, where we can begin to imagine and begin to step off the fossil fuel treadmill, certain challenges and opportunities are posed for environmental justice and labor organizing. Principally, how do we ensure that policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions focus on addressing the questions of environmental equity that were so eloquently discussed this morning. Just some statistics, because I'm a geek, a public health epidemiologist, I have to talk numbers. Um, communities of color and the poor will definitely suffer more from extreme weather events due to climate change. And the reality is that the climate is changing and we're going to be dealing with climate change no matter how fast we move forward with mitigation policies. So it's been estimated that African Americans in Los Angeles are twice as likely to die from a heat wave than other Los Angeles residents. Families living below the poverty line are unlikely to have access to air conditioning and transportation that allow them to beat the heat. We're going to be dealing with increases in air pollution in major cities, which are comprised of significant uh, proportions of communities of color, low-income residents, and working class people. And then there's the issue of who's going to pay the costs of climate change mitigation strategies, whether we're talking about taxing, trading, auctions, caps, et cetera. And so mitigation strategies and climate change itself could result in significant and poten potentially painful shifts in certain economic sectors that have traditionally provided well-paying jobs for working people and may also adversely affect sectors that are not necessarily uh, have strong labor advocacy or significant uh, labor presence, such as tourism and agriculture, that traditionally employ low-income communities of color. Environmental justice advocates and labor groups are working to make sure that climate change policies, such as carbon pricing policies, are as beneficial as possible for workers and low-income communities of color that can be disproportionately impacted by pollution and by the costs of climate policies. Today's speakers will discuss their work on the ground in the communities in which they're doing organizing here in the Bay Area, in the Midwest, and nationally. They'll talk about organizing and advocacy strategies that are seeking to break through old school divisions and dichotomies, the notion of jobs versus the environment, and to encourage us to rethink how we invest in our communities and how we work towards building a more just and sustainable economy. So I want to present my first speaker, 
Lisa Hoyos. Lisa is a senior field representative with the National AFL-CIO based in Northern California. She has a campaign and organizing background in the labor, environmental, and environmental justice movements. She's worked on toxics and energy issues with Greenpeace and on campaigns to improve environmentally sound mass transit. In the labor movement, Lisa has been involved in many advocacy campaigns, including health care reform and living wage initiatives. For two years, she has served as a legislative analyst to the California Natural Resources Committee, which was then chaired by Senator Tom Hayden. During the last year, Lisa has been involved in a collaborative effort of both labor and environmental organizations working to influence the poli policy design of the Western Climate Initiative. I present to you Lisa Hoyos. Thank you very much. Happy Cinco de Mayo. It's great to be here today. So back in the early 90s, well, I actually wanted to lead off with a question. How many folks here would self-identify as being part of the labor movement or connected to the labor movement? Wow, good. How about the environmental justice movement or environmental movement? And then um, academia, business, anything else? Okay. So. Back in the early 90s, I was doing some work in LA, and there was a great group um, of mothers from South Central working on EJ issues, toxics. And they and a lot of others around the country started talking about um, broadening the frame of what the environment is. And EJ came to, which environmental justice, they were saying the environment is not just where we go, some people go to camp or be outdoors or natural ecosystems out there, but rather where we live, work, and play. And the work dimension of that is obviously um, of key concern to the labor movement, but so is where we live and play, because uh, the highly affected communities, highly impacted communities uh, on toxic issues and so forth are communities where our members obviously live. The historic tensions related to jobs versus the environment, uh, back when I first started getting involved in this, I guess 15 years ago, uh, were some around logging issues, preserving the forest ecosystems, versus versus the way it was framed, the, the jobs that were there for loggers. Um, refineries issues, sort of if you're inside the plant gate, you've got your job to preserve. If you're outside the plant gate, there's the public health concerns. And people like Tony Mizaki and others started to say, if you're inside the plant gate, you've also got health concerns. And how do we frame this so both movements, the labor movement and the environmental justice movement and the community justice movements are kind of focusing on the same target, that of the, corp the polluting corporations, um, since, we, since our interests really align, and how do we ensure that the corporations don't divide us. Uh, I would also just point out, given that today we're talking about climate, green jobs, and so forth, that the AFL-CIO in 1997 opposed the Kyoto Protocol. And we're, we're coming a long way, and we're evolving every day as we learn and grow on these issues. But um, I wanted to just point that out historically. Currently, there's some really exciting comings together that I know uh, my colleagues on the panel are going to talk about. There's a clean and safe ports campaign where labor and environmental justice groups are collaborating really brilliantly. There's efforts that Communities for a Better Environment and other groups have worked on uh, on refineries in California. What I mostly want to talk about right now, though, is how we, how we collaborate across movement boundaries. Um, and I'd say a lot depends on, which is just true of humans working together in general, relationship building, knowing each other's organizational structures, and um, at the end of the day, having a social movement perspective and a power analysis perspective that enables us across movements to understand how we're going to inf influence the government, corporate power structures, and so on, and how we're stronger when we do so together. Um, really quickly, you know, labor's got a long history of, of concerns around regulation. Andrea had talked about how we'll be addressing the issue of regulations more. Uh, we're very intimately familiar in the labor movement with laws that don't work, hence our natural skepticism around cap and trade, but our acknowledgement of many of the points Holmes made about that's sort of what's unfolding policy-wise. We think it's significant in California that um, direct regulation is an important part of the AB 32 frame and that only 20% of the emissions reductions that we're pursuing will be around um, 
cap and trade, and 80% would be around direct regulation on, on emission sources. And then finally, in the labor movement and the EJ movement, we have a history of attaching conditions and standards to public funds, hence your living wage campaigns, prevailing wage campaigns, renewable portfolio standards, procurement policies. We've both um, fought strongly for those. I think I'm going to breeze through this because I know at least Aaron will be addressing some of this. In terms of our shared um, political demands and perspectives, if you will, on uh, some of the issues revolving carbon pricing policies, where we, where we share an analysis um, and we've aligned and organized around it. On cap and trade, the issue of um, no, no opportunities for speculation. We don't want this to be market forces, a go-go trying to profit while we're trying to reduce emissions. And um, we also want 100% auction with revenues towards transitioning the economy to a green economy, uh, doing retraining of workers who may be displaced, uh, green jobs development, and so on. Aaron's going to address offsets, but in short, we want to severely restrict their use and limit and limit their number. And we also don't want to let polluters off the hook in terms of co-pollutants. So if you're a refinery, if you're Texaco in the harbor area in LA, and you are able to buy a bunch of offsets by saving a tract of forest um, in British Columbia, let's say, what, do you, what does that do in terms of letting you off the hook? around the air toxics and other um, pollutants right there in our backyard where our community members are and where our workers live. So we share a perspective on that. And finally, this is a big issue in the labor movement and there will be a workshop on it this afternoon, but it's, it's around leakage. We want to make sure that in this cap that there's not holes in the cap, if you will, in terms of um, companies being able to just move their dirty production offshore and then emit somewhere else. But there's sort of a progressive and global way to, to approach this, and then there's sort of a using trade measures to address this. And Leo Girard of the Steelworkers just released a paper really making the case first and foremost for trying to try to have sectoral agreements internationally with international unions so that we're working together across sectors globally to address the issue of leakage. There's also some trade measures. There's something that Holmes will talk about if you go to her workshop. Um, on uh, something called an output-based rebate. I want to flag this excellent report that the UC Berkeley Labor Center produced called California Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, because a lot of these policy measures are discussed there in far more depth than we have time for right now. To me, this is exciting. I mean, I'm always uh, on the side of optimism. But there's a lot to say sort of yes uh, in an excited way about in regard to what labor's positions are evolving to be on the climate issue and on the green jobs issue. And um, in this document that I just flagged, the very last page is something called California Labor Principles on Climate Change and a, um, AB 32. This was approved by the California Federation of Labor last April. And there's just one section I want um, to read for you that I, I thought was really important, and that's that Green jobs must be union jobs of the future. The struggle against global warming is an opportunity to address unsustainable patterns of development, production, and consumption, and to create new and well-paying green jobs throughout California. Um, in renewable energy, the construction trades, public transportation, sustainable farming, and much needed manufacturing for California workers. It's not enough for a job to be with a clean tech or green employer for it to be truly green. Green jobs include any job that has been upgraded to address the environmental challenges facing a state or nation. A green job is one with good wages and benefits, an upward career pathway, and a voice on the job. In short, the protections only guaranteed by union membership. So what I liked about reading that was we're acknowledging that we do, um, as Van Jones will often say, we need to sort of redefine our economy and redesign our economy. And the labor movement's up for the challenge, and we need to partner with uh, our allies in the EJ movement, the environmental justice movement, to, to do so successfully. There's another piece of this, which is acknowledged, and this is because of the work of the last 15 years with EJ collaborating with labor. One of our key principles is equity for communities, people in the poorest communities of our state who have shouldered much of the burden of our carbon-based economy in terms of poor air quality, health hazards, and lower wages and longer commute times must be among the first included in job creation programs, community development, and pollution mitigation efforts. So 
these are all the principles. I think where the challenge come in and comes and where I want to spend the um, rest of our time is how do we then engage each other's movements and organizations um, better? And a lot of us raised our hands saying we're from the labor movement, but about half the room isn't, so this is for, for you. Central labor councils, building trades councils, and state federations are in, well, CLCs and building trade councils are in each county, and those are our principal political and legislative arms. And they have, we have meetings every month. We often have community groups, environmental groups, other kinds of groups come and engage us on a myriad of issues. And that's where all the affiliate unions come together in one place. There's uh, a democratic structure, if you will, elected leadership. In California, we're blessed with very strong central labor councils with staff. We typically have political directors. Sometimes we even have policy directors. That's a point of engagement for community groups, grassroots groups, EJ organizations. And um, we have very progressive labor leaders at those central labor councils. Uh, Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, who just took a job uh, as head of Green for All, just formerly ran the South Bay Labor Council for many years. And so um, I urge everyone in the EJ movement to build relationships with your central labor councils. Get to know your, your leaders there. The same thing with the local unions. Um, many of you have done this already, cl clearly around the Clean and Safe Ports campaign. SEIU and the Teamsters and others collaborated closely. CWA, uh, communication workers on smart grid issues. Uh, and you know, I'm going to go a little deeper here. In terms of us really understanding um, the need within the labor movement to engage on climate, we can even go deeper to not just the sectoral unions that necessarily have an immediate interest in, in the, the climate issues, but also, you know, Bob Bullard, who's a pioneer in the environmental justice movement, and I were talking at the Blue Green Conference in um, Washington, D.C. earlier this year, and he was talking about Mercy Hospital in New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina came through there. That hospital's not been rebuilt. Who knows if it'll ever be rebuilt? What happened to the fabric of that hospital in the community? What happened to all those healthcare workers? We all have a stake in this issue in the labor movement, and, and us being able to grow that and articulate that better and fight harder is, um, is critical. So then a couple of thoughts for those of us in the labor movement. From the principles that, that I kind of read a couple from to the actual implementation and elevation of our consciousness around how important this issue is, both the green jobs and transition issues and also the climate justice issues, we need to do a lot of internal education. Um, we need to also reach out to our EJ ally, allies to discuss the policy and economic and community development plans related to green jobs, economic stimulus, and local climate action plans. And I wanted to quickly, I guess, kind of drawing to a close, highlight a good example of collaboration. This is at the policy level, but Aaron, who works with the Union of Concerned Scientists, is part of a team of enviros who were engaging around the Western Climate Initiative, which Holmes talked about, which is an effort of 13 U.S. and Canadian states and provinces that are trying to have a cap on emissions. And we know each other through that process of engagement, and several heads of state feds have engaged around that, and that's been a really good model of collaboration with um, the environmental community. I want to make a point that's a little, I want to ask this, as I'm an organizer. Who in Northern California, because I looked at the list of who all was going to be here, and most of us are from either Northern or Southern California, who in Northern California has not been in a dialogue with, uh, that's involved both EJ groups and community groups about how to work together? Raise your hand if you haven't been in that kind of serious dialogue about how labor and environmentalists and EJ people can work together. Keep your hand up. That's it, huh? So most of you, so raise your hand if you have and you're in the labor movement. That's really good. I'm glad to hear that. The same in Southern California. Anyone who hasn't been, who would want to be? OK. I expected more hands to go up. But my point of all that was just to say that please come up here afterwards, because there's so many forums of collaboration from the Ella Baker Center to Green for All to um, the Apollo Alliance to our Central Labor Council structures. And so if you're not engaged but want to be engaged, um, we can help with that. So in closing, the quote here, I think the, the best hope for us is um, kind of going back to our roots. And I just wanted to leave on, on these two quotes. One is, um, you know, the 
labor mantra, an injury to one is an injury to all. And this, this other quote, when I was doing a lot of EJ work, we talked a lot about Native American values and principles. But we cannot simply think of our survival. Each new generation is responsible to ensure the survival of the seventh generation. The prophecy given to us tells us what we do today will affect the seventh generation. And because of this, we must bear in mind our responsibility to them today and always. And um, we won't have time for this, but, but Dan, I just want to flag that Dan came and had, from my perspective as an internationalist in my thinking, both environmentally and in the labor movement, had some excellent points to make about um, the other countries and other movements of peoples with whom we share the sky. And so as labor movement advocates, as environmental advocates, um, the, the bridging of those international strategies cannot be understated. And there will be a workshop this afternoon on global strategies. So thanks very much. Adelante. Our next speaker is Nia Robinson. Um, who made the transition from former uh, Climate Justice Corps and Steering Committee member to Director of the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Initiative, which educates and activates a new generation of climate justice activists. Nia continues to move forward from union rallies and picket lines to Capitol Hill with a strong commitment and passion for organizing as she did for both workers as an SEIU organizer and with community members working for environmental justice in Detroit, Michigan. Nia Robinson. So I had a slight technical difficulty and my computer crashed, so I am PowerPointless and I will just have to wow you with my amazing personality and beauty. Um, mm. My name, like she said, my name is Nia Robinson, and I'm originally from Detroit. And I want to, and I need you to bear with me, because as most people in this room who know me know, I'm a, quite a tough woman, not really a crier, but I need to tell you a story to really talk about what the connections are between EJ and labor. So I grew up in Detroit, and I had a really great friend named Alfonso. Um, Alfonso grew up in southwest Detroit, which is where a lot of my family lives. It's the most industrial area in the city. Um, Alfonso, after college, decided that he, I mean, I'm sorry, after high school, decided that he wanted to make way more money than all of us and decided to go work at a steel processing plant. He worked there, very strong union member, um, and went back home daily to his home in southwest Detroit. Last year, we lost Alfonso to what his oncologist had said was the most aggressive form of liver cancer he had ever seen in the 30 years of his practicing. Alfonso was 27 years old. There's so many connections between environmental justice communities and the workers who are represented by unions and workers who are not represented by unions. And I think that we have reached a point where we can no longer afford to not pay attention to those similarities. But it's, it's both of those communities who are on the front lines of non-complying industries and on the front lines of our fossil fuel addictions. We all have seen the science. We know about the flooding and the droughts. We know about the heat waves. We know what happens when energy prices spike and we drive ourselves into a recession. But it's time that we start to look at those things and figure out ways for the EJ community and the labor community to really start to collaborate and to move past the idea that blue and green don't exist together, can exist together, because it is that, it's that industry that's driving us to think that way that wants us to continue to be separate because the collaboration of our power is really what would take the conversation around climate to a new level. These are the communities that are the first to make concessions, to make concessions in their health and benefits, property values, wages. We saw what happened when they started to talk about bailing out the big three. Well, how about we just, you know, give them the wages of the folks who are working in auto plants in the South? Well, how about we give the folks who are working in auto plants in the South the wages of union workers in the North? Um, I think the other interesting thing is that as, as we start to look at it, 
the labor community and the environmental justice community are also the two groups who stand to gain and lose the most if we, from all, we stand to gain and lose the most. So when we start to talk about mitigation around climate change, if we get into a situation where we have poor policy, it is those communities that stand to lose a lot. But it is also those communities that stand to gain so much from an overhaul in our economy, a change in our energy production, and true and strong action from our government on mitigating climate. So whether we use a carbon tax or cap and trade or cap and auction, cap and dividend, or cap and invest, it's important, like Holmes said earlier, that we are ensuring that polluters are paying to pollute. We can no longer allow them to get away with polluting our skies for free. And we know that whether we make them pay or not, the energy costs are going to spike and go up. So why not have, a, have an, an opportunity to collect a revenue that allows us to put money back into communities, to invest in renewable energy, and to also start to really invest in just transition to ensure that workers who are working in dirty industries, like my friend Alfonso, have an opportunity to really partake in the new green energy economy. It also gives us an opportunity to have revenue set aside to make sure that we are creating pathways out of poverty. And I think that the labor movement plays a really important part here because we want to make sure that we're not just creating green jobs, but that green jobs are also blue jobs, and that green jobs are union jobs for everybody. This also gives us an opportunity in the generation of revenue to have opportunities to rebuild our communities. So not just shareholders, but single moms and steel workers have an opportunity to live in healthy, happy communities that are walkable communities, bikeable communities, because we can, no longer cons we can no longer sit and look at the idea of healthy communities as a gift to the privilege, but a human right for all. So as we start to look at what's happening um, in Congress right now, the bill that's getting the most attention is the Waxman-Markey bill, it's the ACES legislation. And for both labor and EJ, it leaves a lot to be desired. There is really no, you know, they talk about green jobs, there's conversation around vulnerable communities, but no true number on the number, no true number on the permits that are going to be allocated and auctioned off, and no real conversation around the, per, the percentages of the revenue that's going to be put into green jobs, put into renewable energy, and put back into communities. So I think that that's really the place that labor and EJ can start to have a conversation around how do we fill in the gaps of this legislation. And so when I start to think about the possibilities of collaboration, I think about, first of all, the coalition of black trade unionists, who has really you know, been one of the, the entities that's really been the conscience of, of trade unions, and also LACLA, uh, the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. And they're all over the country, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists has an environmental justice component that's working with community groups, with schools, both high school and colleges, around how to build stronger coalitions that allow us to have economic prosperity and remove the environmental degradation from our communities. One very interesting um, coalition that's, that's being built right now is in Milwaukee and it's called the Making Milwaukee Green Coalition. It's a group that is head up by some folks who are, you know, with the League of Young Voters, people with the Milwaukee and, and Wisconsin AFL-CIO, and they're really bringing a lot of different expertise to the table and are finally able to have a conversation around how we move forward, how we get past the situations of distrust, and how we partner in a way that gets us just an equitable state, regional, and national um, climate legislation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Rogers, who's from the Western Region, who's a Western Region Climate Campaign Manager for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Aaron's expertise is global warming policy, 
energy global warming solutions, and vehicle global warming solutions. As manager of the Western Region Climate Campaign, Aaron works to bring relevant scientific and economic analysis to the policy decision-making table. She has focused on climate, energy, and vehicle policies throughout her four-year tenure at UCS. And before coming uh, to the Union of Concerned Scientists, she spent a decade as an advocate and lobbyist focused on environmental and social justice issues in Texas, of all places, the belly of the beast. Um, without further ado, I present Aaron Roger. Good morning, everyone. How are you? <laughs> um, I want to thank the organizers for this conference. I think it's, it's so timely, and um, it's great to be around um, labor people, EJ people, and Enviro people all thinking about how we can work together. Um, I want to spend my, my 10 minutes delving into a topic um, that I think is one of the most important issues on the table at the federal level the regional level and the state level in terms of climate policy design, and that is the issue of offsets. Um, I think that they've become one of the most controversial elements of the cap and trade uh, proposals at all the different levels, and they, um, I think they have really become a touchstone for the values that we choose to embody in our climate policy. Um, they, they relate to issues of responsibility. Uh, are we holding polluters accountable? Issues of social justice, um, which include issues around wealth transfer and um, how we treat emission reductions in different countries. Efficiency, how rapidly are we gonna be moving toward fossil fuel abolition? here in the developed countries, in the most heavily polluting sectors of the developed countries, um, and equity. Are we assuring that our, our climate policies meet their potential to achieve multiple objectives, from um, creating good quality green jobs, to reducing air pollution, avoiding further environmental harm, and bolstering democracy and, and civic engagement? And I think offsets touch on all of those issues. Um, not, off, not all offsets are bad, but um, in the worst case scenario, offsets can't, they, they do have the potential to delay, um, diminish, or even destroy our efforts to reduce global warming pollution and meet the, the targets that were set out so eloquently this morning by Pyle and, and others. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of the policy proposals, I wanted to just tell a little story about offsets. Um, and, and thanks to International Rivers for the information on this one specific offset project that I want to start with. This is a hydroelectric dam that was built in China. Um, 7,500 people were forcibly displaced to build the dam. And uh, it was started, planning for the dam was started back in 2004. And then uh, several, several years later, they decided that they could apply for offset credits um, to sell the supposed emission reductions from the dam project to um, fossil fuel emitters in the European Union trading system. And so a, a coal plant in Germany decided that instead of reducing its pollution in Germany, it would instead buy credits from this dam project in China. Um, there are regulations in place in the area where this dam is that would have, that would have banned coal-fired power plants anyway. So this dam is not rep not replacing a coal-fired power plant, and may not may actually cause uh, methane emissions. So it's not reducing global warming pollution, and yet um, the 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 coal plant in Germany is now able to. Um, keep emitting 450,000 tons of global warming gases every year because of these credits. Um, and this was sold under the clean in the clean development mechanism. In, in the U.S., or say here in California, for instance, a hypothetical situation where if we had a cap-and-trade system running, there could be a plant such as a fossil fuel plant in, say, Potrero in San Francisco that... Um, under a cap and trade system could choose whether to reduce its emissions or instead shut down the plant and, in, and invest in renewable energy, or it could buy offsets from 
a place like China where they're doing massive amounts of hydro projects. Um, this this um, plant in Potrero is in a, in a community that suffered for many, many years from disproportionately high levels of pollution. So what would be ideal is if our cap and trade system required this plant to either clean up or shut down. And with offsets, that, that may not happen. Um, what could happen if we limit our offsets is that instead of that, that Potrero plant um, continuing to pollute the SFPUC could instead invest that money into something like um, the, a project that's up at the City Council or S Board of Supervisors today in San Francisco, a solar project where solar panels are being put across the Sunset Reservoir. And because um, of local pressure, local activism, um, green jobs advocates have required that this project um, it, 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 we expect it to create about 70 new green jobs, that up to half of those have to come from the most disadvantaged communities in San Francisco. So we're hiring locally, we're creating good jobs, and we're having an environmental benefit at the same time. That's, that ideally is how we would like our climate policies to work. Um, we know that in-state global warming action creates jobs. As Dan mentioned earlier this morning, the Energy intensity of renewable jobs is much higher than fossil fuel um, job intensity. UCS, Union of Concerned Scientists, recently completed a study that showed that at the national level, if we can reach a 25% a renewables level, we can create almost 300,000 new domestic jobs in the US. At the same time, we're, we're saving consumers billions of dollars a year in electricity and saving carbon emissions. We, uh, we also know that in-state global warming action has a whole range of co-benefits, including air quality co-benefits. UCS worked with Professor David Roland Holst, who's on the agenda this afternoon, who's an economist here at UC Berkeley, to do a study looking at, at the co air, air quality co-benefits in California of limiting the use of offsets. And what we found is that AB 32 can be, can be implemented without the use of offsets, creating about a half a million new jobs and further reducing our particulate matter, our NOx, and other criteria pollutants um, by, by pretty substantial amounts. Um, PM 2.5, which is the mo tiniest particles, the most harmful, can be reduced in the equivalent of what would be 9,000 big rig heavy duty trucks driving on our roads every year, just if we just from our climate policies. So I want to end with um, mentioning a bill that's now up in the California legislature, and it's about offsets. Hopefully all of you will, will become endorsers of this bill. It's AB 1404. And I think this bill can really be a, a model for what should happen within the Western Climate Initiative and also at the federal level. Um, this bill is sponsored by UCS and the State Building Con Construction Trades Council, so it's a joint environmental labor initiative to limit the amount of offsets that are used in a California cap and trade system to less than 10% of the total reductions that we expect to get from the cap and trade program and to prioritize the offsets that are used so that they are ones that um, have co-benefits that help reduce air pollution in dis disproportionately affected communities, or have other health or environmental benefits for California. And the ban, the bill bans um, credits coming in from the clean development mechanism. So this is just a list of, of all the supporters we have so far. There's something like 65, 70 different supporting groups, and I hope that um, that all of you will, will consider endorsing the Labor Feder Cal Labor Federation, Apollo Alliance and Building Construction Trades Council are all um, endorsers of the bill, and it's going to be going to the assembly fl floor in the next couple of weeks. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Hopefully we'll have some time to talk a little bit more about the details of AB 1404. Our last speaker is Mia Yoshitani. Um, who has an extensive background in community organizing, 
campaign strategy, leadership development and training, and organizational development, and a long history of working in the environmental justice movement. In her 20s, she was executive director of one of the largest student and environmental networks in the United States and worked broadly in international environment and development networks, organizing for environmental and economic justice. Mia first joined the staff of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, APEN, in the mid-90s as a youth organizer and has served as lead organizer and development director and spearheaded APEN strategic planning. She took a short hiatus and lived in Australia for five years with her family and has now uh, come full circle and returned to the Bay Area. And she now serves as APEN's Associate Director. Mia. Again, my name is Mia Yoshitani. I work with an organization called the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. And APEN was founded in 1993 to organize low-income Asian Pacific Islanders around environmental justice issues, but primarily about building power in the low-income API immigrant and refugee community. And um, we, we have two projects, one in Richmond, one in Oakland, where we really strive to create a world uh, where everyone has a right to a healthy environment where they can live, work, and play, and thrive. And to that end, we, we have worked on, over the years, many, many campaigns. Um, a few, uh, one was a multilingual warning system uh, because of uh, accidents at the Chevron refinery and the communities that we were working with couldn't receive the emergency warnings in English and didn't understand them and therefore were doing the opposite of what they were supposed to do in the event of an emergency, which was um, going outside to find out what was going on. So um, that was one of our first campaigns in Richmond. Um, and we worked on uh, organizing Chinese immigrant workers who were being poisoned uh, by uh, arsenic at a semiconductor product uh, company that called AXT. Um, we've also organized around um, low-income uh, housing and affordable housing in Oakland. Um, and so the, I wanted to just say that because the question you might be having is why does a community-based organization like APEN care or not care, but why are we actually engaging in a process around um, climate policy? And I think we've kind of already started to answer some of those questions, but um, so some of the obvious ones are, one, uh, our communities are already bearing a disproportionate burden and will be the first and worst hit. And you've heard that many times. And that's such a simple thing to say, but um, it's so important to understand that um, the communities that we've been working in have already been the ones bearing the external costs of the fossil fuel industry. And so as they're fighting to, to help bring about the end of the fossil fuel era, um, these are folks who have already been on the front lines and have already been disproportionately poisoned by the industries that we're, we're talking about. And as we approach the, the impacts of climate change, these are the folks who are going to be bearing the brunt of everything that we've been talking about. The economic crisis and restructuring, food shortages, energy costs, increasing pollution, changing weather patterns, natural disasters on the Katrina scale and, and beyond. And so, of course, we have an interest in trying to be at the table. Um, the other side of why we're engaged in this is uh, the issue of equal access, equal access to community benefits um, when we're talking about climate solutions. Um, and now that the, that the country has finally got to this moment where we are no longer living in denial, and we are, we are acknowledging um, the science, and we're also acknowledging the monumental shifts in the economy that this is going to take. Um, I think it's obvious that you know, our communities, both working poor and organized labor, and community met frontline community members, fenceline community members, we all want to be at this table. And we want to be at the table for the main meal. We don't want to be at the table 
for the scraps. We want to be there when these decisions are being made in the, in the forefront, not fighting amongst each other for the few benefits that we can eke out um, after the main decisions have already been made. So that's one of our primary interests of actually being here and being with you today. Um, and so I, you know, I think there are, uh, there are other people who could talk more eloquently about the, the specific policies. I am not a policy expert. Um, I tried to last night kind of do some more research on some of the deeper policy issues that we can be engaging on. Um, my two kids are, are home with me all week this week because their school was closed because of uh, the, the swine flu, um, <laughs> otherwise known as H1N1 or something. Um, but anyway, so, you know, but I, I, I never meant to come here posing as an expert. I'm, I'm a community organizer. And thank goodness I work with a lot of other people who have uh, some who spend their lives working on policy, and that's not really my forte. So, but there are a few things that um, I think are really important for us to think about working together. Um, just transition, both for workers and communities who've been impacted and who will be impacted by this economic restructuring. Um, the workforce development initiatives, um, hard caps on hotspots and regulations for co-pollutants, um, and obviously green jobs and quality training standards and public investments and incentives. And I think that I'm really looking forward to a conversation where we can actually talk about how we can work together on those things, among others. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of where it where the rubber hits the road and what it's like on the ground of trying to work in partnership. Um, and I think we all in this room probably value um, the idea of common interests and communities working together with organized labor. Uh, I don't question that at all. Um, but for us in our campaigns, you know, we have been dealing with this jobs versus environment wedge issue in a very real way. And one of my interests in being here today is to really figure out how we can work together and overcome this. Not just holding hands on a national scale, but like in the communities where these campaigns are being waged, where we can actually support each other and learn from each other and engage deeply together. Um, Years ago, when I first started as an organizer in, uh, in Richmond, uh, we started to engage in a process um, called Just Transition. And that was uh, with, a, there was a, um, an organization called Just Transition who is bringing together um, groups like ours, community-based organizations who are fence line communities and, and living with the pollution in the fossil fuel industry with what was at the time the OCAW. And uh, we were engaging in a really deep and meaningful level with our staff and our members, um, political education, uh, actually sitting around the table talking about what our shared interests were. And that was really transformative for us and really gave us this feeling that there not only could we talk about shared interests, but we could, we could live it. And we could work together in building our campaigns together that way. Um, and unfortunately, as happens, uh, OCOW merged with PACE, or became PACE, and then PACE merged with the United Steelworkers. And in the midst of all that, uh, this whole project just faded away. A few years down the track, last summer, uh, in, our, in, in the same community, we were uh, fighting the city council because they were trying to um, approve a, uh, a retooling plan by, by Chevron, the Chevron refinery. Um, they were applying for... Um, a permit to do this retooling 
that would allow them to invest a billion dollars in the um, in the re refinery to do a lot of things that the community probably wants them to do, which is like um, update the equipment, make the make the plant safer, um, all these things because we know that the, the refinery is there to stay for the time being, but they are also allowing the industry to refine dirtier, heavier crude, which could increase the air pollutants by as much as 50 times. So this community that's been living with these co-pollutants all along was being asked to take $61 million in community benefits package in exchange for this upgrade. And the community was saying no. And as we were in these meetings with the city council, I just wanted to reference this one time when we had organized many of our members to come out. And um, we had union members coming up to our 60, 70 year old members, intimidating them, asking them for uh, their, their proof of citizenship. They were threatening them. They were telling them that they were, um, you know, that they, they could be deported. And these are refugees from Laos. And I'm not saying this because I'm trying to at all pick a fight. What I'm trying to do is just talk about the reality and to express that we're desperate for this opportunity to work together and that we both, we both have the onus to come to the table and to understand what our shared interests are in this. Um, and I think that, you know, definitely our organization could have done things differently and could have, um, could have made a stronger approach to the union, but there are some, some pretty old historical things that we have to deal with before we can move on to this lovely, great picture of the future. Um, and so I just wanted to end by saying, you know, there are also really great examples, and I won't talk about, but like, you know, the, the Coalition for Clean and Safe Ports is a great example of EJ groups working c together with labor um, in a shared power situation. And we need more of these real equal partnerships on the ground where we can roll up our sleeves together and win together. And we need to do more of that sort of deep engagement with each other. Um, and everyone's talking about this moment of opportunity that we have where all these factors are lining up both incredibly positive and incredibly scary, that compel us to take these greater risks, to be together, um, to work in new alliances, to think really, really big about restructuring the economy, to create more, a more sustainable and healthy planet. And so I guess I think like the word opportunity to me just doesn't really do it. Um, it's more than an opportunity. An opportunity to me is like, uh, you know, free tickets to a baseball game. That's an opportunity. Uh, two for one at the grocery store with, uh, you know, that's an opportunity. This is actually an imperative. It's not an opportunity, it's an absolute imperative. We have to work together to create a sustainable economy that, suppo that supports basic needs and basic rights of everyone in the community. Um, and I also just wanted to add that even though this is a really important place, a really important arena where we, can, where we can work together, that our common interests don't begin and end with green jobs. We, we all need, we all need healthy living wage jobs. There's no argument there and, and we are gonna be there to support those and to help bring those to our communities and bring those benefits. But we all need healthcare. We all need affordable housing. We all need decent education. We all need clean air to breathe. We all need clean water to drink, healthy, green, just communities for all. And that's where I feel like we need to start the conversation. So thank you very much and really thank you for coming today and being with us. I 
would kind of agree with you about the idea around the, this very strong focus being on greenhouse gases. I would take it a step further and say that the reduction really seems to be focusing on carbon dioxide, which is why there's such a huge conversation right now around carbon capture and sequestration. And also, while there's such a huge conversation around offsets and being able to reduce your carbon emissions in another country versus having to do it right here locally where you are. Um, I think that it's really important that the environmental justice community be steadfast in that conversation because what we know is that it's not the carbon dioxide that is killing us, but the co-pollutants that are also coming out of these facilities that are killing us, polluting our children, and really destroying the health and livelihood of our communities on a daily basis. So we can't really continue to allow the conversations of CCS to just be had in a way that does not deal with the issues of co-pollutants because even though you're taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, you are still pumping NOx and SOx, mercury, and all of these other things into the atmosphere that are causing increased asthma rates, increased rates of sudden infant death syndrome in our communities, pollution-induced diabetes, other neurological issues, and other respiratory diseases. Okay, thank you, everyone. We have to wrap up because of lunch. Um, hopefully, we can continue this dialogue and discuss, as Mia talked about, uh, the imperative of um, joint EJ advocacy and labor organizing to address uh, climate change impacts. Thank you.